So, good morning, everyone. So, we are going to um, enter into uh, the mathematical preliminaries for doing cosmology. Um, in the last uh, talk, uh, I mentioned to you the cosmological principle, which says that the, um, there, in our universe, there exists a time function so that its level sets are isotropic and homogeneous. And the purpose today is to define precisely uh, what these things mean and how to give them mathematical content. And for this, we're going to uh, need the notion of isometries, of killing vectors. Killing vectors are generators of isometries. Uh, we'll need the notion of lead derivatives, and this is uh, what we're going to, to do today. So, uh, subsection, lead derivative. So, the lead derivative will have to do with uh, differentiating along a vector field. Um, and uh, without using a covariant derivative. So that's the uh, main point here. And we're going to see shortly how all this ties uh, with uh, the notion of isometries and so forth. So, uh, so the main point is uh, define a differentiation. with respect to a vector field in the direction of a vector field, uh, which is going to be capital X uh, without further structures. Uh, so, for scalars, we already know how to do this, right? So for scalars, we know how to differentiate a function f. Uh, x of f is just uh, uh, d f over dxi dxi times xi. And uh, this is going to be our definition of the lead derivative of a function along a vector field. By the way, I'm going to uh, show you shortly how D derivative has to do with flows and transporting objects. Uh, and the right way to do it would be to start with the notion of transport and of flow and so forth. However, it takes a lot of time. So I'm going to do it uh, in a kind of axiomatic way does tell you how we define this uh, and mention to you how this fits to a elegant geometric definition later, but we will not have time to, to go through the other way around. So set up a nice geometric definition and derive this notion from here. Good, so from a vector field, why? So we want a differentiation operator, which takes a vector field, produces a vector field, uh, and involves a direction x. But we already know one such thing, that's the commutator. So let's just um, not, of course, not f, but y. Let us just define the lead derivative of y by the bracket and don't ask questions why. So, this is a uh, we take a vector field y, we produce a, a 
a new vector field by doing this commutator. So uh, if you've forgotten uh, how what x y is, then when in coordinates it would be the vector x k d k y i. So there is a part which differentiates the vector uh, y, and you have to remove a analogous thing with x and y interchange. So this is the commutator. Uh, another way of uh, viewing it is that if we take a commutator of two vector fields acting on a function f, then this is x acting on y of f, and we remove y acting on x of f. Good. So why not? Okay, so that was the point here, differentiation in the direction of vector field X. I didn't write it, but I said this, which does not involve extra structures, right? So we don't have any extra structures here. And then everything else, uh, use the Leibniz rule. Use the Leibniz rule. Uh, with respect to uh, tensor products and contractions. So, so that's, uh, that's how you do this. And uh, uh, I could stop here, but let's just make some explicit uh, calculations for uh, covectors and, and so forth. So get rid of this. It's hard to believe that we finally have a bit of summer, right? And it's also so, uh, it's a bit depressing to be in this cellar here rather than this beautiful sunshine, but well. So uh, let's see. So four covectors, right? So covectors. Uh, how would this work? We want Lx of alpha of y should be uh, the lead derivative of alpha acting on y plus alpha acting on Lx y, right? So that would be the Leibniz rule under contractions. So uh, we've already done this, uh, put this upside down. The lead derivative of alpha of y is Lx of alpha of y and then minus alpha of Lx of y.
so so obviously if we define the lead derivative of a covector like that then the leibniz rule will be satisfied but the question is uh, is lx alpha a covector field so you know, I can just write any definition I want. I could yeah, I you know, multiply by 25 or something like that. Uh, well, that's the only definition is compatible with this, right? So, uh, so with the Leibniz rule. So, but uh, what's not clear is that this is a vector field. So, so let's check, right? So, uh, um, we want. Uh, Lx uh, alpha of y plus z is equal Lx alpha of y plus Lx alpha of z. Well, th th this should be obvious, right? So, so let's see. Let's put the equations here. A little bit maybe one this would be two uh, zero would be uh, lx f is x of f right so so this is obvious because uh, in two everything is linear under uh, and uh, adding vector fields right so But what is less obvious is Lx alpha of Fy is this equal F Lx alpha of Y. So this one is true, but needs checking. Uh, Well, both need checking, but the first, the previous one is kind of obvious. So let's try to do this, right? So check. Uh, let's see. So let's calculate Lx alpha of Fy. We take our definition two. Probably don't have enough plus, play, uh, place for this, but. Let's hope for the best. Uh, so that would be Lx of alpha of Fy. This is just a multiplication, not F of Y, but a multiplication. Minus alpha of Lx of Fy. So I need to erase uh, part of the of this, but you can meanwhile try to figure out yourselves whether this has any chance to work. I think at least one person in the audience have been has been following the lightboard lectures of a colleague here, whose name I will not say, who was erasing each time with paper. So every lecture, you know, uh, half of the Wiener Wald was gone <laughs> in the, it was so irritating. <laughs> I mean, lectures were very good otherwise, but I just couldn't take this. So,
Okay, so let's continue our calculation. So uh, alpha uh, of f of y is scalar. So the lead derivative is just our formula here. So we have to add with the vector x on alpha of f of y. Uh, but then alpha is uh, linear. So I can just put this in front. So this is x of alpha. F of alpha y. And now I need to calculate the second part. So this is minus alpha of the commutator of x of with f y. Well, this one I, I can either use the uh, coordinate formula or something like that. Uh, to check that uh, this is x of f y plus f commutator of x y. Uh, because the commutator of two vectors is that x differentiates f y and then f y minus f y differentiates x. So when x differentiates f y, you get x of f times y. And then when uh, y differentiate x. Well, you get two. When x differentiates f y, you get two terms. X differentiating f times y plus a term f where x differentiates y. And the other one just combines to this. Now here, uh, we have the Leibniz rule, which says that this is x of f alpha y plus f x of alpha of y. And there's a minus here. Uh, OK, so uh, how does this work now? x of f alpha of y. OK, so this term cancels out with this one. And remember that alpha is acting on, on all this here. So we get f of x of alpha y minus alpha and uh, alpha is linear. So this is f and x alpha of y. Okay, so, so three is satisfied. Good. So, so uh, this is the definition for covectors and. Uh, as I said, uh, now you extend to uh, any tensor by using the Leibniz rule. So I'm not going to, to use, uh, to write it, uh, well, maybe I should. Yes, in coordinates, right? So how does it look like in coordinates? Uh, so we want to look at two in coordinates now. Um, so two in coordinates. So if we look at the alpha component of 
Lx alpha. So by definition, this is Lx alpha acting on di. Which is, so this is the definition of what a component is. So this is Lx of alpha of di. And this is of course alpha i minus alpha acting on Lx of di. Now, this is a function, so this is just the derivative xj dj of alpha i minus alpha of the commutator of these vector fields. So let's try to work it out. Uh, this is x di. Now, when you calculate the commutator, you have one term where x differentiates the coefficients of this guy, which is zero, right? So, uh, so zero minus a term where this vector differentiates the coefficients of of the first entry, which gives me this. And we act with alpha on this. So, um, well, the minus becomes a plus. And we have alpha of di xj I have a tendency today to write too many brackets. So somehow I love brackets today. Let's go for them. Um, so DJ and the bracket is here. Alpha is linear. So uh, this term goes in front and alpha of DJ is just the J component of alpha. So this is, uh, as I said, uh, xj dj alpha i plus alpha is linear. So this goes in front, di xj, and you get uh, remains alpha of dj, which is alpha j. Okay. So this is an X alpha I component. So let's uh, write one in co coordinates uh, to make it clearer what's the difference. So if I look at the 
I component here, I'm going to get xj pj alpha over yi minus <laughs> minus uh, yj pj xi. So it looks a bit similar. If you're differentiating, Lee differentiating a one form, uh, you get a term where x differentiates the coefficients. Here, if you're differentiating a vector field, you get a term where x differentiates the coefficient. And then here, you have to correct uh, with a term which contains derivatives of x. Um, with a plus sign. And well, what is the only possible contraction? Uh, this index is down, so it has to be down here. And you have a contraction of the index on alpha, which is down with the index up here. So the second term is again, the only possible contraction, maybe I should have written it in the, uh, same order uh, as, as I did above, so that one sees better the, uh, I, I'm going to write the same, so there's, there's nothing wrong here, but one will see better the analogy. So there'll be, well, I need a term which is where X is differentiated and I need an, index uh, i, which is up, right? So it's going to be d, j, x, i, y, j, okay? So if I write in the same order as here, then you have a term derivatives of x contracted with alpha. Here we have a term derivative of x contracted with y. And the only possible contractions which leave an index i up is, uh, well, with, you have to have a contraction with y, which, so that's the only possibility, and then i is here, okay? So, so that's, uh, my way of remembering this is, of course, just that you have to change the sign. So, the derivative is anti-symmetric, so I remember that the sign is minus here, right? So, the sign has to be minus, because the lead derivative changes sign when I change x and y or the Lie bracket changes signs. And uh, I know that when I'm going to a one form, I have to change the sign compared to this. Good, so now let's say, let's take a, a two covariant uh, tensor. So the rule would be that LX of alpha tensor beta should be LX alpha tensor beta plus alpha LX beta, right? So the lead derivative should satisfy the Leibniz rule with respect to the um, tensor product. So uh, let's use this formula, so LX alpha i beta j should be first lx alpha i beta j plus alpha i lx beta j. Well, let's just, uh, Get rid of two.
So uh, let's continue, right? So this is, uh, we just worked out what this is. So that will be X, J. So it'll be X acting on alpha I. Times beta J. And there'll be a term with a plus now because it's a covector plus uh, X J over I alpha I. And there's something similar here, plus xj dj beta j alpha i plus, uh, aha, so terrible, terrible mess with indices, right? So, so since I'm using i and j, I cannot use j in the contractions. So I have to use a different index here. I've forgotten, uh, this is all wrong. <laughs> uh, well, we'll get there. This shouldn't be, uh, of course, you can't have twice an I here. This one is shouldn't be an I either. And this one shouldn't be a J because we're using J already. I should have written X of alpha and then I wouldn't have to worry about this index here. So there's a K here. And this one I need to, to worry about it. So XK uh, and then uh, well, alpha i is also here. Alpha i and Lx beta j would have xk over j beta k. So the first two collect to xk of alpha i beta j. And uh, well, the uh, two here are, well, uh, and I forgot a beta j here. So uh, plus xk over i uh, alpha k beta j plus xk over j alpha i beta k. Okay, good. So that's the formula. So if I take a general to covariant tensor, well, it's a sum of elementary one, right? It's a sum of tensor products. So if I write a, uh, well, for example, G is GIJ DXI DXJ. So it is a sum of vector uh, of tensor products. I can use this formula, uh, which probably has a number now four. Uh, so use linearity. Uh, to get the obvious thing, right? So you have to, uh, you start with a sum of terms like that. So you have to sum the right-hand side. So uh, the sum will reproduce the components here. The sums will reproduce the components here. So I, I just write the formula rather than deriving it and maybe you can, Cross check yourselves that my formula will be correct.
Yes. So, uh, so for implies Lx gij will be one term where x differentiates the coefficients, and there'll be two terms uh, with a plus. where you're just contracting with the first index and another correction term where you're correct contracting with the second index. Uh, just a small thing. Um, mm -hmm. In the first sum of four, I think you forgot del K. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yes, yeah, so if you use the Leibniz rule on this term, you're going to get derivative of alpha times beta plus derivative of beta times alpha. Uh, now there's a useful fact what I wrote here. Obviously, using symbol G, you think, well, it's a metric, but this formula is true for any. Uh, two index uh, tensor field, two index contra a covariant, right? Because covariant, we have pluses. If it's uh, a contravariant, would be like vector fields, we get minuses. So I'm going to write the general formula shortly. But uh, uh, so, so again, this formula five would be true for any two index covariant tensor field. But if we take G to be the metric, well, then first it's symmetric, then it's invertible, right? So, uh, and if, if G is the metric, uh, in this case, we have this uh, formula, uh, which is D I X J plus D J X I. So this is a very important formula. And you think, well, this obviously depends upon the Christoffel on the metric. And the whole point was to have a formula which does not depend upon the Christoffel on the metric. And of course, for a general tensor, this is a formula. If Gij is a general tensor, then the, nothing depends upon the metric, right? This, this would be your, your tensor here. But now it turns out that if the tensor differentiating is the metric, you get this uh, nice uh, formula here. And this operator here uh, is called the killing operator. So, uh, Alex, so the right hand side uh, of six is called the killing operator. And the equation uh, Lx g equals zero is called the killing equation. And uh, killing has nothing to do with some murderous uh, plans, but it's just the name of the gentleman who, who studied this equation intensively for the first time. And the equation Lx g equals zero which is the same as the symmetric part of the covariant derivative of X is called the killing equation. And I think you've already seen this equation in the tutorials. So, uh, well, this equation six is very easy to prove. by going to adapted coordinates.
Well, I'm really getting better and better at this. I mean, there's nothing to, almost nothing to correct here. Yeah? Uh, so proof of six. Um, Uh, so in local inertial coordinates at a point P, well, uh, if we use five, is the same as this vanishes. So zero. plus, uh, well, we can lower the index of X uh, with uh, the metric. Of course, this means that we enter with G inside the differentiation, but in lo at local inertial coordinates, at this point, the derivative vanish, so I can write it as X J over I plus X J over I. And nothing prevents me to write two terms like that. So this is d i x j plus t j x i. So this is really a cheap proof. Not much work to do. Of course, I could just work in any coordinates and laboriously write the gammas uh, and, and it will work but um, but that's uh, the simplest way to do this so it's weird right because if you look at this it looks like just derivatives of x if you write it like that it looks like derivatives of the metric but somehow all these things compile. Yeah, it's two different ways of writing the same. Thing. Um, you have written two times x j over i. Yeah, I shouldn't have. Uh, okay. This one is uh, so I'm lowering this index uh, to get an x i. Thanks, uh, Eva. Right, so I can just add these gammas to uh, to make this a covariant derivative and another set of gammas to make that a covariant derivative. And I, I get this because the gammas vanish uh, at this point. And so the last thing to say is, well, the left-hand side is a tensor because we know that the derivative is a tensor and the right-hand side is a tensor because obviously this is a tensor. And two tensors equal in one coordinate system are equal in every coordinate system. Right? So the fact that I've proved that this is true in some coordinate system implies that this is true in every coordinate system. Good. So what else can we say about this Lie derivative? Uh, so the general formula, which just follows from the rules I've indicated. If I just take lead derivative of some tensor, y1, yk, j1, jl, then you'll have a term where x differentiates klm the coefficients. I don't need a bracket. So. But you've already decided that I'm into writing a lot of brackets today. T I one I K J one J L. And for each index up, you're going to get derivatives of X but with a minus sign, because we remember that commutators 
signs change. And for index down, you get uh, derivatives of x, but with a plus sign. So that's how it's going to work. So you can just, while I'm erasing, try to write down yourselves what is, what should be added here. So let me add the lower indices once because I already written the plus. So uh, for every index down, I need to add a term, uh, well, a term dx times t. And so if I take the first index j1, I have to replace by something, say m. Uh, and the other ones. So if I've put an M here, I need an M here. And the only way where this J1 can go on this derivative is here. And I'm not going to write the other ones. And by, so this was an index down, therefore a plus. And we get a sequence of terms with a minus. Uh, of course, the indices, uh, these ones are still here. So now for the first index here, these ones just are left untouched. So I have a minus because it's an index plus. The only way I can put an index uh, here is like that and then I1 and so this is uh, a general formula. Now, uh, a useful fact, I'm not sure we're going to use it much, but, uh, but it's still true. And this is an exercise that you take a commutator of the derivatives. What could it be? That's the lead derivative of the commutator. So this is an exercise. Exercise in English C or, or S? S. So C I S E, that's the question. <laughs> that's an S? <laughs> yeah. Okay. To say so. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, in French is a C, so in English it's an S. Okay, good. Uh, so, what else could we say here about these lead derivatives? Uh, maybe the following. Uh, suppose that. X is just, uh, say, the derivative in the first coordinate. Then the lead derivative of the metric 
will be well there is a term where you're differentiating the metric and there are two terms dx times g twice but this is zero right because the coefficients here are constants so this is d1 gij so if the lead derivative is zero is the same as the metric does not depend upon x1 So G I J uh, does not depend upon X one. So this is the same as saying that translations in X one are isometries. Translations. in x1 do not change the metric that's the definition of isometries so this observation ties everything i've been doing today so far with the notion of isometries right so i've been promising you that we could talk about isometries if x is a just a, we say it's a generator of translations. It's just a vector which is only, has only one component. Uh, then uh, the fact that lead derivative of the metric with respect to this vector field vanishes means that this is an isometry. So we're going to see more generally that this is actually, uh, this has something to do with. Uh, Completely generally, this equation has to do with isometries, but for this, we need to understand flows of vector fields, and that's our next uh, thing on the plate today. So flows of vector fields. So uh, this is about the following. You start with a vector field. You solve the equation which uh, in principle can be solved. In practice, that's a different problem. But you write down an equation, uh, a differential equation that in principle, you know you can solve. And the solutions of these equations are called flow of a vector field and and uh, well we'll be of course interested in the case where these flows are isometries so new paragraph 612 eva please correct me if this is wrong this is would be no, that should be right flows of vector fields
And the way it works is as follows, given a vector field X, Uh, the flow phi t of x is defined as follows. Uh, first, solve the equations dx mu over d t and this is the the, the reason i stopped is that uh, i realized that uh, in one of my exams people had problems uh, differentiating between lowercase x and uppercase x and therefore it's not a good idea to use both lowercase x and uppercase x however in this business uh, you're always talking about the flow of vector field x so let's make clear right this is uppercase x here and this is smaller So you solve this equation with initial value x mu of zero is equal x zero, All right? So you choose a point x naught on your manifold. You have this vector field x, which is defined on, on your manifold. So this equation is telling you that the vector field capital X is tangent at every point to this curve, right? So you find a curve X mu of T with the property that at every point of this curve, the tangent is your vector X, right? So this is, your, it's hard to see here, but this is capital X. Capital X. And so you start with some point X naught. You solve this system of equations. It's a system because, uh, uh, well, this uh, there are several indices. And so phi T of X naught is just X mu uh, X of T. So this is X naught. You flow along this field for a time T. So this is X of T. So the flow of X is defined. You take a point, you flow by time T. Uh, you move by time t along the curve so that capital X is tangent to this curve, and this is your phi t of x of x naught. And the notation here is terrible. That's not what I should have written. This is phi t, phi t depends upon the vector x and of x naught. This x. So often I will write uh, phi t uh, when x is known, when, when x is implicitly known.
Do I need an E in implicitly here? Should this be without the E or with the E? Wikipedia or Merriam Webster online? My intuition says without the E, but I can quickly check. <laughs> Please check. I, I think it should be without E, but. Well, let me know when you've checked. So, so that's the definition of the flow. So maybe examples. Let's start with an easy one. X is D1. So if we call this star. So do I need an E or not? Has anyone checked? I do? You don't. Don't need the E. Thanks. So obviously I'm not that good in autograph, but at least I can at least see that there's something fishy when I write something wrong. So I'm still not there, but maybe I get there at some stage. Oh, when, with age, it's not getting better actually. Yeah, so <laughs> good. Let's take X is equal, equal uh, D1. So this means that uh, DX1 over dt is one, dx2 over dt is zero, right? And so forth, which means that, uh, well, maybe not equivalent because there's this initial value here, but at least implies would be the right way to say that. So this one we can solve. So x1 is, x01 plus t, x2 is x02 plus nothing, right? uh, just doesn't move, x3 is x03 and so forth. So one way of thinking about it is as follows, you have the uh, x is going, so if this coordinate uh, x1 is going in this direction and the x2, x3 are going in this direction, then the integral curves are just the lines, straight lines going up, where the two and three coordinates don't change and only the first one changes. So, so what is this flow therefore then phi t of x naught one x not two. This marker is dead. Let's take another one. I don't like this one. Let's try the blue one. Uh, x not three. Can you still? Yeah, I can't see, so that's not very useful. Uh, is this any better? Is, uh, huh, it's not very good either. Um, so this is X not one plus T x not two, x not three. So in other words, if I just write phi t of x would be x plus t, x one plus t, x two, x three, and so forth. All right, so a very simple example. This one we can actually solve explicitly. 
Good. So, so, uh, so your the flow is this uh, family of of maps parametrized by a parameter t, and uh, which are obtained in this way described here. So uh, let's do another example. So the next example will be one dimensional. Uh, of course, uh, vector fields in one dimension seem to be kind of trivial, but you can still talk about vector fields in one dimension. I say uh, one dimension is just your favorite, say axis R or maybe a circle. And you can still think, talk about vectors tangent to a circle or to the real line. So, uh, Sounds a bit funny if one is not really used to it, but so another example. So we're going to take the vector field x is x square dx, so on R. So there's only one coordinate. So this x, this two here is a square, not the second coordinate, right? But it's a, uh, it's, Two. So we have to solve um, dx over dt is equal x square, with x of zero is x zero. So let's do. I don't like this marker at all. Let me see if I can find it. One which is more fun. Um, let's see. So uh, the equation is dx over x square is equal to dt. So if I integrate, I'm going to get um, minus one over x of t plus one over x of zero is equal to t. Right? Integral of dx of x squared is minus one over x. So heavy algebra, one over x of t is equal one over x zero minus t. So x of t we do it slowly because otherwise I get it wrong. Okay, so I'm just putting this on the other side and I'm switching side whatever. Then I'm inverting this so that's x naught, x naught minus t. And uh, problem, right? What is the problem? Uh, Nonsense. Um, I, I've told you there's heavy algebra involved, and therefore 
I have to do it carefully. And so obviously the heavy algebra was not done carefully. Uh, multiply by X naught, I get one minus X naught T minus. And yes, so the Baku catastrophe. Uh, one has a problem here. Uh, T x not not equal one. So, in other words, uh, here. Uh, Well, so I can just write this as phi t of x now is x over one minus dx is defined well at t equals zero it's always okay right but so you can go so say if you think about this as a as a flow uh, so let's do this. Uh, uh, case by case, if x is zero, then this is defined always, right? So uh, phi t of zero is zero for all t. Uh, only on a range for a range of of parameter t. So if x equals zero, that's defined for all t, there is no issue. So let's see if x is positive, then uh, the problem is when t is equal on over x. So, uh, well, uh, the formula applies. So let's see, so star applies or star, uh, star applies. Uh, but only for t in minus infinity and one over x. And if x is negative, then again we have st double star. But now the problem would be if x is uh, negative, it's probably one over x infinity, right? Mm -hmm. So this example tells you that one has to be a little careful with these flows. And this gives the definition. Uh, we say that a vector field X is complete. If phi t of is defined for all t and x. So there exist vector fields for which this uh, flow is not defined globally. And uh, if X is not complete. Uh, we talk about a local flow. So my definition was actually not quite right at the beginning, uh, a local flow. Why? Right, because you can't go all the way with all the parameters. So you have a, you talk really about a flow where everything is nice and defined for all values of coordinates. But um, if it's not like in this case, then you just have a local. So 
uh, what can I say more here? So of course the, the vector field D1 was complete, right? So the first example we saw, uh, the flow being just translations on R, this was a complete vector field, this one is not. Now the flow is, uh, has uh, various nice properties. So the properties I'm going to list will be uh, simplest if you assume that the vector field is complete, because then you don't have to worry about domains of definition and stuff like that. Uh, so that's uh, what we're going to do. And there is a version of all this. which does not assume completeness. So some properties. If X is complete. Uh, first, uh, phi zero is the identity. And this is, uh, well, let me just write these properties and we'll worry about them. Then phi t composed with phi s is phi t plus s. C uh, phi t is invertible. ways uh, phi t to minus one is phi minus t. Let's see if I need uh, some other property here. Um, if I go, uh, if I take the flow of minus x, this is the same. So I'm going forward with the vector minus x, and this is the same as going backward with the vector field x. And uh, proof. Well, A is obvious, right? So phi zero is the identity because you have to solve this equation and, but you don't solve it, right? So T, uh, you don't have to solve it if you just want to go along this flow. Uh, for a zero time. So, so we have this, uh, let's do B. So we have a point uh, X, which we start here, and we go for a time T, so we get phi T of X here. And well, 
I should have gone S here, but doesn't matter. Well, that's uh, so actually I could uh, just write, well, E phi T commutes. So I take a point X, I flow for a time T, then I take this point and I flow for a time S, then this is phi S of phi T of X. This is this point here. And the claim is that this is the same as phi of S plus T of T plus S, right? So S plus T of X. And the proof is just by uniqueness of solutions. of ordinary differential equations. Right? So I have a solution which goes by time t from here to there. And I have a solution which goes from time s from here to there. By uniqueness, this is the same as the solution which goes from time s plus t or s t plus s from here to there. Right? So this is, this is uh, the proof of B. Now C, uh, well, uh, phi T composed with phi minus T is phi T minus T, which is phi zero, which is the identity. So, so uh, phi minus T is phi T minus one. Maybe let's do uh, E, right? So phi T composed with phi S, the same as phi T plus S, which is the same as phi S plus T, which is phi S composed with phi T. And uh, while D is the same picture as before, uh, so let's see. So this would be now D. So if I go from this point by the time T with the direction of minus X, Right, so this is, I'm going along this curve for a parameter t in direction minus x is the same as going uh, in the direction plus x from here, right? So that's, <laughs> actually I've drawn it the other way around. So let me try again. <laughs> so what I've shown is, uh, phi t here, phi t of x. Not optimal. This lecture is not optimal at all today. But we will survive. Okay, so what I've shown here is that uh, phi t, uh, if I go phi t of x is the same as phi minus t of minus x. So if I put, uh, replace t by minus t, I get that phi minus t of x, same of phi minus minus t of minus x. Right, so this is, uh, Everything here was clear, 
when x is complete uh, otherwise it works locally right so otherwise it works locally i mean these pictures are true locally you don't need to be able to go to, to infinity to prove something so for every point these things are uh, uh, these things are are well defined for small t at least right so so you can apply all this argument near every point for some values of t which you could just try to formalize but uh, uh, the bottom line really is that these things are essentially true always uh, when uh, locally So this is the last thing I wanted to uh, mention today that uh, so so just the terminology so so a collection of map a collection of uh, maps satisfying A and B is called uh, one parameter group of diffeomorphisms. Of diffuse. Now, uh, such a group defines a, a vector field. Uh, so this collection phi t defines a vector field in an obvious way. X is uh, d phi t over dt t equals zero. And then uh, this family phi t is actually the same as the family generated by this vector field. And finally, all these facts are, remain true locally. And I'm not going to write a formal statement, right? So there is one has to be a little careful, but if X is not complete. So true locally, good. And this is a good moment to stop. Do we have any questions? If none, then I'll see you uh, Thursday. Bye, everyone. See you then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye.